you for those who are here in person and maintaining your physical distancing, almost. <laughs> I'm going to wait for you to move six feet apart. <laughs> um, and for those of you who are um, calling in remotely or connecting remotely, a uh, special appreciation for you and your efforts for your ability to maintain your physical distancing. I'm going to start as usual. Oh, I'm Dr. Gail Newell, Health Officer of the County of Santa Cruz. I'm going to start with the usual briefing of our, num our data points. And I do want to tell you that um, as of last night, we launched our new data dashboard. And I think you'll find it very physically appealing and um, also has much more data, the kind of data that the community has been asking for, but we just didn't have enough cases yet to break things down in a way that would protect patient privacy. And now that we have more cases, we can do that. So um, I'm going to use our data dashboard um, data and report out to you on some of that. So at this time, we have 76 known cases of COVID-19. Um, that was on the data dashboard last night. Yes, it's been updated. Yes, it's been updated. I could find it on the video, but I didn't call in on the uh, huh? telephone town hall format. Hey, can you mute your phone, please? Please mute your phones. Okay, so data dashboard found at santacruzhealth.org. And um, so as of this morning, I guess it was updated since 5 p.m. last night, we have 80 known cases with still just one death of a Santa Cruz County resident. Um, the breakdown of those by age is two in the pediatric range, so under 18, 14 who are 18 to 34, 28 who are 35 to 49, 20 who are 50 to 64 years old, and 15 over the age of 65. One of the cases is still under investigation to determine age. Of the known cases, the 80, 35 are male and 45 are female. We've been able to break down the type of exposure for some of the cases. 20 of the cases remain under investigation, but the remaining 60 are broken down as follows. 12 of our cases are travel related. So we knew from early on that we had some cases from the Diamond Princess and the Grand Princess, and we're also expecting to get some travelers from the two ships who have ported in Florida. Um, 25 of our cases are community acquired, which means there's no specific source located, so they were acquired somewhere in the normal day-to-day -day business of folks moving around the community, and 23 were acquired through a close contact, so a known positive case with contact to these folks. Of the 80 known cases, 13 required hospitalization during their COVID-19 illness, and one of those died. 30 have recovered. That's a new number that we're just releasing now, and we've firmed up our definition of recovered, working along with the California Department of Public Health to define what recovered means. And 30 of our 80 have recovered, so that's fantastic news. In terms of the number of cases tested or the number of labs performed, um, we know our positive, so the 80 cases there. In addition, we've had a number of additional cases tested through the public health lab with um, the remainder being through commercial labs like Quest and LabCorp. And so our negative lab test results we've uh, had are close to 1,500, so 1,469. This is nearly a doubling of our negative lab test results in just a week. So we see that testing is finally ramping up. Um, there are at least three um, healthcare systems who plan to have testing next week. So that's very exciting. Um, one being Dominican Hospital, another being the Dignity Health Systems, and then also here on our own Emmeline campus in our uh, clinic located here. Um, our known cases by geographic area, 27 of the cases are in North County, 
30 in Mid County and 14 in South County. Nine are still under investigation to uh, determine location. Um, we do have breakdown by city and by um, area census track and that sort of thing, but the numbers are too small to release at this point and still maintain privacy. But what I can tell you is everywhere has known cases. And when I say known, um, we're assuming that there's a greater number by far of unknown cases. Some folks have estimated, some experts have estimated possibly as many as 20 unknown cases for uh, as as far and in addition to the known. For each known, 20 additional unknown cases. That's a very loose estimate, however. Um, I've already talked to you about the new dashboard, data dashboard on our website. Uh, let's see what else is on the dashboard that I haven't covered. Um, the dashboard also covers um, uh, chronic condi disease conditions in our known cases. So it's broken down by zero, one, or two chronic disease conditions. So you can see that. And as expected, um, those with hospitalization were more likely to have underlying chronic disease conditions. Also more likely to be male and more likely to be older. We also have um, graphs demonstrating both our, our known cases, new cases by day, and in addition, our cumulative counts, and also um, broken down by geographic region, as I mentioned. There's also on our website a new graph posted that shows the curve or doubling time of Santa Cruz County compared to all of the other counties in the state of California, and there's very um, optimistic news there, although it's also very early, but we are among the very best counties in the state of California in terms of flattening the curve. So instead of a doubling time every six days, as we had anticipated would happen in a community like ours, we are now having a doubling time of eight days. A two-day difference doesn't sound like very much, but it's huge. And so I want to make sure that the community understands that this is because of them and their efforts and their willingness to shelter in place. So I want to thank our community members for following the social distance requirements and sheltering in place. Um, hard news, uh, I think the community mostly knows that I've issued a supplemental health officer order to close all of the beaches and all of the parks in our county for one week. And the reason we did this was in anticipation of this holiday weekend, we expect the weather to be better, to be sunnier. Um, traditionally, many people celebrate Easter outdoors. Uh, many religious groups gather during this time. Passover is also happening now. And so we want to make sure that the community understands that gatherings of any size are not allowed even in outdoor spaces, and we want to discourage people from using our parks and our beaches to gather because this is where infection rates are shooting up, where we're seeing big death rates and, and infectious uh, outbreaks is when people gather in large groups, whether it be for funerals, for church services, for social gatherings. So it's so important that our community understands that that is not allowed by the current health officer orders and from an infectious disease point of view is very dangerous. So I think I'll end there for now. Would either of you like to add anything in terms of a statement? Um, I can talk a little bit about our PPE distribution. Yeah, I'm Dr. David Giladucci. Um, so uh, there have been a lot of um, requests from the public and from our healthcare providers for PPE, as you know, there's a, na a nationwide shortage. There's some encouraging news at the state level that they've been able to acquire, I think, up to 20 million masks a month now that uh, should be distributed, and we're, we have a system in place where we uh, request those resources to come. We've also prioritized what types of PPE go to whom and have allocated it based on the sort of size of the organization and the type of medical activity that they uh, perform. Um, we are, are looking at even non-medical kind of congregate settings like assisted living and board and care and getting some uh, protective equipment to them as well that's appropriate for that setting. 
And then, of course, uh, uh, an important aspect are facial coverings for the public, and that's uh, being handled through a separate division through donations, uh, but uh, that is part of our PPE, if you will, distribution. So that's, um, I think, all I have for that. Yeah, um, I think I can talk a little bit about alternate care sites. Um, many of you know that we've identified two alternate care sites, one at Simpkins Swim Center and another one at 1440 Multiversity. Um, and it's important to know that how and when we implement these sites is related to the data that we have and the number of cases that we have. So uh, as we flatten the curve, our projections for when we will um, implement or activate these um, alternate care sites also extends. So we had originally had a request in to the state for disaster service and medical reserve core workers to start on Monday. Uh, but our hospitals are not seeing the surge as early as we had thought three weeks ago due to the increased doubling time. So we've delayed that request for a couple of weeks. And um, if our community does really, really well with social distancing, we hope we can delay that even more, perhaps indefinitely. One of the things I do want to note is that uh, when we are ready to post our modeling curves for projections, they will be refined every week based on actual data. And um, there is a best case scenario and a worst case scenario. We prepare for the worst case scenario. And there is a worst case scenario that has us exceeding the number of beds available, even with our alternate care sites. And so one of the things that the state has been really active in doing the last couple of weeks is um, taking a look at California regionally. So we were actually contacted by Seton uh, Medical Center. It's a, it's a facility that the state bought to be a federal medical station. And they have said that they will be receiving patients from Santa Cruz should we experience a surge that exceeds our hospital system and our alternate care sites. Okay, why don't we start with questions on the phone? Does anybody on the phone have a question? Please unmute your phone. Hi, this is yeah, hi, this is Nikki Morris from the Santa Cruz Dental. Um, yesterday, Can you guys hear me? Uh, uh, one at a time. Ben Hart was talking about how he supported uh, possibly extending the order of the closures of beaches and parks. And I'm wondering at this point, what is the likelihood that you're going to do that given the summer months are coming, coming up? I very much value the outdoor spaces that we have in our community, and I know that all of us do, and it's a big reason why we live here, the outdoor beauty, and most of us rely on the beaches and parks for not only our physical health, but our mental health as well. Um, there's also an issue of equity, um, that uh, the poorer you are, the harder it is for you to get to an outdoor space. Um, for example, we know in the South County there's far less park space per capita than there is in the north part of our county. And um, for those reasons, my intention is to reopen all of the parks and the beaches um, in one week. The order, the supplemental order is for only one week. Um, it may be that there are areas, specific parts of parks that I do not reopen. For example, despite our warnings, the skate parks have continued to be a problem and social distancing has not been able to be maintained in the skate parks. Same in the dog parks. So it's likely that I will extend uh, the closure of the skate parks and dog parks. Um, but I do intend to open the rest of the outdoor spaces um, at the end of this supplemental order um, next Wednesday at midnight. All right. Nick, go ahead. Hi, Dr. Newell. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the growth curve that we're seeing doubling every eight days. And it looks promising on its surface, but can you explain how residents should be looking at that and any um, challenges with interpreting too much into that curve, whether that relates to testing or anything else? How should we be looking at that rate at this point? You're exactly right. With only 80 known cases, um, any modeling we do for our community is uh, very tentative, and we're really looking at it on a day-to-day -day basis. <clears throat> and um, if you 
are able to look at the model on the data dashboard that's released by the state, um, you'll see that our curve is much flatter than the rest of the counties. That's due to, um, I believe, to our, our community's excellent response to sheltering in place. So um, that's what's working. We're not ready to lift that now. And as you see with my beach and parks closure, I'm especially worried about continued um, compliance with those orders. Um, so was there another part to your question I may have forgotten? Yeah, just is there anything that you're aware of, particular to Santa Cruz County, that could be um, influencing that data, such as testing numbers or any other area beyond um, social distancing working? Is there anything else here that could be artificially lowering those numbers compared to some of these other counties? Or is your sense that at least based on what we know, social distancing really has worked here better than in some other areas? Right. Well, in addition to known cases, we also look at hospitalizations and ICU admissions, and those can be used as a proxy uh, for known cases and spread in our community, and those jive very well with our number of cases. So everything points that we're moving in the right direction and that the community members really need to continue to do what they're doing because it's working. Sure. Um, what's the latest number of hospitalizations and number of ICU beds occupied? Is it possible to get that number more frequently updated on the data dashboard? And third, is it, um, are we testing everyone who's an inpatient? There's a new website at the California Department of Public Health that is um, updated daily with data. The hospitals are now required to report to the state every single day with their current bed count and their current bed capacity. And so you can go to that state website and you can click on Santa Cruz County and you can see our current bed count and capacity as well as the current number of COVID cases who are hospitalized in our county. And that's updated every single day. Dr. Newell, this is Phil Gomez. Um, are you concerned that people are, you know, with all this good news and everything else, that people are going to drop their guard and perhaps you know, disregard some of the social distancing and the like. I, I mean, it appears to be working, but, you know, all this good news may lead people to, you know, forget these these rules and, and meet in groups and the like, and all it would take is one to make this grow even bigger again. Uh, you said it exactly right, Phil. I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> I am concerned, and I'm concerned as we get uh, sunnier weather and warmer weather, and as summer approaches, we're going to have more travelers come to our area. Um, there's measures that we're taking. Um, I'd like to commend the sheriff for his invaluable partnership and our local law enforcement. Um, we're also working very hard at um, working with the Airbnb, VRBOs, and hotel industry to make sure that they're only housing essential travelers, so people who are here to do essential work only. We do not want vacationers in Santa Cruz County at this point um, because they will bring the virus from their um, more infected communities, especially if they're coming from San Francisco, San Mateo, Santa Clara, um, our neighbor counties uh, who are experiencing much worse impact from this virus than are we. Now that there is a recovery number and we have some of those cases reported, um, what is the follow-up with those patients um, that, as far as public health goes? And then um, if, if this is available, do we have a, a broad age range of those people who have uh, recovered? Um, as I said, most of the ones who have um, been hospitalized and the one who died were of older age, mostly male, mostly with an underlying chronic medical condition. So you can assume that the recovered ones are opposite of that, that they're healthier, younger, more often female, uh, more resilient overall with, in better physical health. Um, our infectious disease um, unit, communicable disease unit, to this point has been able to follow each individual case and notify each of their household contacts, their close contacts, employers, schools, 
um, entities in which they may have had close contact and work to identify further cases. That's how we've identified, um, I think it's 23 of our cases, yes, the, the close contact cases. And um, so at this point, our numbers have not been overwhelming, and so we've been able to do that. Just to follow up on my last question, um, is every single person who's hospitalized, like every single inpatient, are they all being tested for COVID? Um, and also, a question about PPEs, is every single hospital employee receiving PPEs or just the ones in contact with people suspected of COVID? When we take both? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, uh, as far as who gets tested in the hospital, um, our understanding is that most hospitalized patients are being tested if they're considered to have symptoms consistent with, uh, you know, a viral infection. You have to COVID. have symptoms. Uh, typically, now this is going to be some variability depending on the clinician that's taking care of the patient, but, I, uh, but we've certainly prioritized testing toward that population because it's important for the um, hospital personnel to know uh, because it helps with um, not necessarily treatment but also disposition and, and PPE preservation uh, and so forth. So, so that is a prioritized group. They have an expedited testing process. Typically, return, uh, the turnaround times for those folks are about... 24 hours, whereas uh, it had been much longer for everybody else. Uh, we've also prioritized uh, testing of healthcare workers. I want to emphasize, though, that testing does not work when you're asymptomatic, uh, or at least uh, the reliability is very low. So there's a consequence of getting a test when you don't have symptoms, that you get a false negative, uh, you get a negative result that may actually not be uh, the, the case. And so you have this false assurance that you're somehow fine and free of virus when in fact you may actually be infectious and and so uh, so we don't uh, we really caution against uh, testing of well people but there's a lot of anxiety of course now the second question the PPE um, does everybody in the hospital wear PPE uh, the hospitals have been responsible for their own policies and my understanding is both hospitals uh, Watsonville Dominican and also Sutter um, have, uh, I believe Sutter, has imp have implemented a universal uh, masking or facial covering policy. So even people that are working in administration or, uh, or like in registration and so forth that may not have direct patient contact, uh, they're wearing some form of facial covering. Uh, it's really important right now, uh, until the supplies of PPE come up, it's important that we don't um, divert um, you know, uh, the real PPE, if you will, uh, the medical grade PPE to people who aren't in a medical um, setting. So, uh, so it's a kind of a tiered approach there. One of the things I'd like to mention about our PPE distribution is the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention does have guidance on use of PPE and optimizing it when um, we have shortages. So right now we're in something called contingency status if we have even fewer, we're going to move to something called crisis status. And so when we distribute our uh, future PPE, we're asking that all of the requesters in the health care system give evidence that their, their, their burn rate and their strategies are optimizing PPE right now according to contingency status. Thank you. I just wanted to confirm um, the testing rates. So when we met last week, it was about 450 tests results that have been received, whereas now it sounds like it's almost 1,500. So that's almost a triple testing results in, in less than a week. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. I was referring to a March 31 number that was 740. Okay. Um, so, but yeah, it has increased tremendously. We've just been given an email that total negative labs are actually 1,673. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Can you, can you talk about the long-term plan to get everyone out of lockdown since things seem to be going better than we thought? Say it one more time. Lifting the lockdown? This is Stephen Baxter at Santa Cruz Local. Since things seem to be going better than anticipated, what's the plan for lifting the long-term long lifting the lockdown? Well, it's not really a lockdown because a lockdown would be that people cannot legally come and go from our county and it's still possible for people to come and go from the county, as you know. Um, so the order is a legal order, but it still allows lots of movement for our residents, so not truly a lockdown, so I want to avoid using that term. Um, 
it's going to be a while until we lift the shelter in place. Um, as you know, the current shelter in place order extends into May. Um, and we are anticipating that that probably will be extended. As our current modeling shows, that's going to be about the time that we have a surge in healthcare needs. That's not going to be a good time to lift our shelter in place order. That's when our cases may be at their peak or at least the shoulder. And um, if things go as anticipated, the shelter in place will be extended. If I could add, just excuse me, uh, uh, I was using this earlier with Mimi. Uh, I, I was I used to be a firefighter before medical school, and this is very similar to that kind of scenario where you know you go into a fire, you do the knockdown phase, you got the flames out, there's smoldering embers here and there, and if you then packed up your hoses and left and left everything to where it was, it's going to rekindle. And so uh, the the uh, the issue is very similar in this situation that. We're in the knockdown phase right now with uh, the social distancing, the shelter at home orders, the closure of the beaches. Um, it's very important that we don't um, that we don't relax some of these restrictions um, too soon because you will get that rekindling. So, if that's a helpful way of thinking about how this works, I think it's relatively straightforward. Thank you. Excuse me. Can I have to follow? What what data point will you look at to guide that decision? What could we be looking at? There was a question Steven, back there. we're going to have a question in the room. Go ahead, John D. The question is, have there been any uh, health care workers, uh, first responders, firefighters uh, with a confirmed diagnosis? Yes, there have. Will you call out that number as to how many? I don't have that number in front of me, but um, assuming that the number is significant, I will share that with you next week. If it's just a, you know one or two, I, I'm not going to share that, but I think I can provide that next week. And Good question. Do you have a follow-up? Do you think it's responsible for NBC TV to hear a big TV show about surfing featuring people from Santa Cruz on Saturday? <laughs> um, well, I don't think I'll comment on that one. <laughs> Go ahead, Stephen. Um, what? Two questions. One, what data point will you look for in terms of lifting shelter in place? I know you talked about hospitalization. On April 1st, it was it was nine. Now, yesterday it was 14. Today it's 13. Obviously, we have a ways to go, but is that the key stat? Like, what, what should we be looking for? Um, because our testing is not widespread, we are relying on hospitalization and ICU admissions for uh, to give us a, a better idea of where we're going with the infection in our community. Um, obviously, if we had larger numbers hospitalized and in the ICU, we would be really concerned that we're missing a lot of cases in our community. But as I mentioned earlier, the hospitalization and ICU numbers indicate that we're capturing a, a fair number, enough of a number in our outpatients to know where we're headed. And this is Mimi Hall. I'd like to add Dr. Gilarducci's example of putting out a fire, but then embers starting a hot spot. That's when the testing, expanded testing capacity is really going to uh, be a useful tool is um, as we get control of this, when we start having new cases in different places, um, the testing is going to be the thing that allows us to understand where that's happening and uh, properly control new small um, outbreaks in regionalized areas. And we're getting there. And there's going to be massive expansion of testing capacity in the next few weeks. Go ahead, Drew. Uh, following up on, on the testing, could you guys elaborate on the, um, the three new um, testing sites that you mentioned? Um, the, I know that uh, Dom Dominican Hospital has acquired um, a system to do point of care testing. So the test is performed right there at the hospital. Their intention is to initially use it only for their own patients in the hospital. So whether it's inpatient or people who are in the emergency department, they're not gonna run it on mild cases or people who just want to know. It will be used for hospital sick level patients. Um, they're hoping to be ready to run with that next week. Um, I know there are nationwide shortages of both reagent and swabs, so it's not enough just to have the equipment. And then there's a training component as well and a quality assurance component. 
So I don't want to promise on their behalf that the testing will be available, but they're hoping for next week. Um, same with Dignity. Dignity has an, a, another point of care system um, with an even more rapid turnaround time than the Dominican hospital. And my understanding is that they already have the reagents and the swabs in place um, and that um, I believe they got four um, pieces of equipment. So they may be doing it at more than one site. And um, then the third is our own um, clinic here on the Emmeline campus and um, also point of care testing. So the tests are performed right here in the county, right here on site. I would like to add a reminder that okay. these aren't public testing. so. People shouldn't come to the drive through clinics and at, at, they still need a referral from their provider, no matter where they go. Kara Meiber Guzman from Santa Cruz Local. <clears throat> uh, because it sounds like, um, from what you're saying, Santa Cruz County is doing a little bit better than, the, doing better than other counties in the state, would you ever consider, you know, um, maybe limiting entry and exit from Santa Cruz County, setting up checkpoints? Um, that is a possibility. Uh, two of my health, fellow health officer colleagues did that this past week. So both are in the Sierra area, um, one in Mono County and one in El Dorado County. In both of those counties, there's very limited hospital capacity and healthcare capacity, but large numbers of vacation homes. So what they were seeing was families from Sacramento, San Francisco, Santa Clara with a ski condo, for example, or a home up in the Sierras um, were spending their shelter in place time in their vacation home and then those folks would fall ill and um, having been exposed in their home communities bring it into Mono or El Dorado County and place a burden on the healthcare system that they were not ready to handle. I know there was a case in Mono County of someone who needed to be helicoptered out because they were critically ill, but because of the snowy conditions, the helicopter took almost all day, which really delayed the, the care of uh, that critically ill patient. And so um, we encourage people to shelter in place at their primary point of residence and not utilize their vacation homes um, for this time. I think there was a question on the phone. Questions? I'm sorry. This is Nick oh, Ibarra with the Santa Cruz Dental. Okay, um, can, let me just ask this really quick and then, uh, then go ahead. So my question is relating to the long-term and short-term projections um, that you mentioned earlier. Sorry, the best case and worst case projections. Um, what can you tell us about each of those cases, the best case scenario and worst case scenario, and why not release those projections to the public at this point to better inform people about the data that is informing your decisions? I think we're getting there. I think we'll be releasing those projections very shortly. Um, we've uh, already presented them to our Board of Supervisors in a closed session and to some of our healthcare partners as well um, and to our own Emergency Operations Center. Um, that as our numbers grow, we're more confident about our projections. It's sometimes difficult for the community to understand um, and they get very worried about the worst case scenario. And um, so we're trying to balance um, the fear factor per se um, that these might present if folks are focused on the worst case scenario. Um, and also there's others people, as has been mentioned already, if they look at the best case scenario, they might feel really good about getting out of their house and, and not following shelter in place. So. Um, it's more about how can we make these more interpretable to the public and um, make that information best understandable. And uh, my, <clears throat> excuse me, I might add, Dr. Giladucci here, <clears throat> because the, the numbers that are fed into the model are so small that the, uh, the, the usefulness of these models, um, they can change from week to week. So it, uh, in some ways may not add a lot of information for your readers if, if we release models that um, don't have some degree of certainty to them. And they may, if they're changing week to week, they may undermine the trust of the public if it's a constantly changing yeah. target. Right. So we're trying to um, be judicious about um, what, how useful the information is. 
Um, thanks again for doing this. This is, this is great. Um, I'm curious to hear more about um, our at-risk communities. So the homeless groups and migrant communities, how are they faring right now? And are there any kind of targeted preventative actions that you guys are working on? I'm so glad you asked because I was going to bring it up if you didn't. Um, our communicable disease unit is shifting its focus now from individual cases to working with congregate living settings. So of course our most vulnerable population who lives close together in groups is our persons experiencing homelessness. And we've partnered with the Human Services Department um, to ensure that more and more of those folks are sheltered every day. So as you've probably heard, the um, vets halls have opened for sheltering purposes in both uh, Watsonville and Santa Cruz. And um, in addition, we are beginning to hotel people in um, a motel in the Beach Flats area of Santa Cruz. And we have additional contracting going on with more motels and hotels. Um, we're planning to provide uh, isolation housing for people who have COVID-19 and need to be separated out from the community, but don't have their own home to do that in. So the hotels and motels will be helping to do that. And same with quarantining are the, their close contacts. Um, and then right now we're also housing some of the um, elder uh, homeless individuals, as well as those who are medically fragile. Our other efforts are focusing on skilled nursing facilities. Um, you've probably seen in the media that these have been um, hot points for other communities who are in the middle of their surge. Um, even in Southern California, some of them having to be evacuated because staff have not been able to come to work for lack of personal protective equipment. Um, so we're focusing our efforts now working actively and proactively with the skilled nursing facilities to ensure that they're able to receive COVID positive patients and learning how to protect and cohort house those. Um, in addition, we're very, uh, we're working very closely with the jails. Um, and again, I want to thank Sheriff Hart for his um, cooperation and collaboration in doing this. The jails have been doing screening and readying themselves already for two months. So they've been very proactive. We've been working closely with them. And then any other congregate living settings such as residential care facilities, long-term care facilities, um, we're working proactively with all of those to get them ready for COVID patients. during a time frame when we had a large back uh, backlog in testing and so that's why it's important to look at the at the overall line trend of the curve as well as the day by day so you might recall in in the last few weeks we had um, once the commercial tests came on board they had a huge backlog and um, some of them were backlogged seven or eight days and then all of a sudden all these results came in and so I encourage the public to not look at the day by day positive because that's that just means that's the day we got the results back. So it's more important to look at the, the curve, the cumulative case curve than it is the day by day. And then when people are looking at the data dashboard, these last 10 days or so may look low artificially because we're still waiting on test results um, during that time period. So there may have been tests done that um, some of the lab turnaround times are still over two weeks. Um, Dr. Gillard, last week you, you mentioned that the rough projection of when um, ICU bed spaces would fill up is uh, end of April or early May. Um, has that changed at all uh, this week? Um, no, it looks the same. In fact, um, there are early indications that it may be long, later than that, but we're still using those numbers, those dates. And just to, just to follow up on TPE, 
Is there a certain number of PP that you've requested a, a, a month, or, or based on after Gavin Newsom announced the, uh, you know, the large number that's available? Uh, yes, there is a certain number, um, and typically we don't get what we request. I don't know the number offhand. Uh, but we are uh, we're trying to we're, we're taking requests from from different stakeholders and uh, trying to fill those uh, to the extent that we can we're not holding on to any here uh, we have a very small kind of emergency reserve for certain keyhole uh, stakeholders if they run out but we're not storing or stockpiling any here as soon as they come in they go back out is there a rough estimate if you're not signed mm. do you happen I to know, know yeah you do no, okay we've We've received um, and distributed. Um, we've received ninety-three thousand. We've distributed nearly all of that. And I think our last shipment, our last shipment was April first, but we did get a shipment last night, and I don't know the disposition okay. of that yet. Dr. Gilarducci, mm -hmm. uh, you said last week that it's not a matter of if, but when mm -hmm. we exceed our surge capacity. Is our max surge capacity of ICU beds still 50 beds, and what's the plan for when, if and when we get there? Uh, when we exceed that, okay. Well, uh, the uh, some of the sort of fallback positions are uh, requesting more ventilators from from the state if those are available. We're hoping that maybe as other places that are hotspots like uh, New York State. Um, Maybe in the next couple of weeks they're able to release some of the ventilators that they have and those can be moved to others where new hotspots come. So uh, getting those will be important. Um, it's not just a matter of having the machines, and I think I said this last week, we need the people to know how to, uh, how to manage a ventilated patient. And, and that is a, a physician skill that not everybody has. Um, but uh, there are a fair group of people like anesthesiologists, emergency medicine people that wouldn't traditionally manage people on vents. But have you know the sort of training experience to do that so uh, so I hope we don't get to that number uh, we're preparing for getting over that capacity and um, uh, what you'll see though part of the intent of the alternate care site is that the cohort of patients that are in the hospital will get sicker and sicker and uh, we're going to um, try to relieve the strain on the hospitals by taking those patients that are Kind of in, in transition from being in the hospital and going home and then providing a kind of transitional uh, sort of place to be until they get well enough to go home. So we're hoping that, uh, you know, essentially those spaces will open up for sicker people. But and is it still 50 beds as our max surge capacity? Yeah, the number uh, can vary a little bit. Um, I've been kind of using 49, but it depends on there's a lot of little details in there about what kinds of vents and whether they're pulling some out of storage and refurbishing. So um, I would say roughly 40 to 50 would be something I would count on. Do we have anything else on the phone? Okay. Anything yeah, I have one more. Yes, I got one. Yeah. <laughs> um, let, let me just ask this, Stephen. And then, um, so going back to testing, do you have an estimate of our weekly capability, including commercial labs um, or by some other metric? of currently conducting tests, and do you have a goal uh, that you would hope to raise that to with these additional three testing sites or in some other way? The first answer is no, and the second answer is we'd like to be able to test everybody who has symptoms eventually, especially as we come uh, uh, go to the, the downhill side of the, our curve. Um, as Mimi was mentioning earlier, it would be helpful for us to know um, the prevalence in our community, and so it would be helpful to be able to test everyone who's symptomatic. Steven? And just really quickly, do we have any sense of the outstanding tests that, um, with commercial labs, do they tell you at this point how many tests are outstanding? No, nope, we have no way of knowing that. We wish we did. We, we get anecdotal evidence from okay. clinicians that tell us it's taking a while, but I think the hospitalized patients, the turnaround is quite quick, and then their capability, of course, is going to be faster. So, Steve, given, you give, given that Santa Clara County has done more than eleven thousand tests, and our county has done about fifteen hundred, how useful is it to compare number of cases county to county? Santa Clara's. Uh, we believe two to three weeks ahead of us on the curve. 
So I don't think it's just a matter of the number of tests done per, cap cap per capita, uh, but also the pre an indication of the prevalence of disease. They have more sick people there and people who are sicker, far more hospitalizations and death than we have. We hope we never get there ourselves, even on a per capita basis. Um, but at, at this point, um, they, we do look to them as part of what of lessons that we can learn. And, and this is Mimi Hall. I will point out that Santa Clara's doubling time, which is an important number to look at, is much shorter than our counties. So um, that means that they're the spread is faster there. Maybe the Seed Medical Center, is that in Daly City? Yeah. Is that the right one? Yeah, and um, my understanding is that the state made a purchase, and so there's something called federal medical stations, and I believe that there will be three federal medical stations in the Bay Area, and the state is looking those at, looking at those as um, providing regional capacity to all of the Bay Area rather than um, being limited to just the county that they're in. There's another one in Contra Costa. I can't remember where the third one is. And, and that would be if, like, by the time, like, basically, it's overflowing here and, and even including alternative care sites? Yeah, and actually, the state, uh, the, the dashboard that Dr. Newell mentioned earlier, where you can go to the state and see everyday real-time hospitalization, um, the state's also taken over collecting um, daily, statewide, um, other kinds of more detailed information from the hospitals and so what they're trying to do is assist the locals so if we get to a surge in one of our hospitals and they're seeing that we're nearing capacity they have the ability to quickly in a day take a look at what regional hospitals have room so that we can um, work within our regional systems to get patients to the care that they need. So that's a, a follow-up to what Dr. Ghilarducci mentioned about the 50 ventilator capacity um, in addition to the 50, we have Seton on standby for us. And then this morning I was on a healthcare leadership call um, where the leaders of Kaiser Permanente pledged to include Kaiser in their regional approach to ICU and ventilator beds. That was very good news. Johnny, do you want to take us home? Uh, yeah, so my question has to do with uh, when you say underlying conditions. I did read the Italy study where they talk about things like high blood pressure, heart disease, lung disease. But I think when I hear the word underlying condition, I mean, uh, who knows what that is unless you're a healthcare professional. So are you going to be specific on that? And then would there be like further in-depth analysis of maybe the kinds of drugs that people might be taking for heart disease that might somehow put them at higher risk for uh, a COVID fatality? Right, so um, one of the concerns specific to drugs was the ACE inhibitors that many people are on for their high blood pressure. And there was an early report that possibly ACE inhibitors made people more likely to become sicker or die. That has been disproven to this point, and people are encouraged to continue their ACE inhibitors, um, at least with the data we have for now. There was a very helpful publication that the CDC released last week in their Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report. It's called MMWR. And they looked at a long list of uh, pre-existing medical conditions or chronic medical conditions that make people more likely to die from COVID-19 virus. And they came up with three of the long list and they're broad categories, however and they were um, chronic lung disease. So that would include things like asthma, emphysema. Um, the second was cardiovascular disease, so any kind of heart disease, stroke-like conditions. And the third, which is very prevalent in our community, especially our Hispanic community, is diabetes. So those were the three categories that they found evidence to support um, people likely to becoming sicker and die when they had a COVID infection. Okay. Thank you, everyone. We'll do this again uh, next week, if not sooner. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.